out of the thoughts I wanted to finish that we were talking about earlier is back to the mass. Because I said earlier that it's God offering God to God, but why is that important? It's because our whole faith can be summarized in a circle. And that is what Thomas Aquinas calls exitus reditus. The only Latin I'm going to give you. But all comes from God, all will return to God. All of our faith can be summarized in a circle. Now, when we came from God, what do you think of? Creation, right? So the Trinity here, the first person of the Trinity, God the Father, we attribute creation. We were created. Now, it took Adam and Eve all of what? 10 minutes to get broken? It's kind of like your child when you give him a new toy. He'll break it within 10 minutes, right? That's what my dad used to say. He said, he'll have it broken pretty soon. Because I used to try to take things apart and put them back together, and then I'd break them. So all of us came from God. We were created. Then in 10 minutes, we got broken. So in the second act of mercy, that was the first great act of mercy, creation. Then in the second great act of mercy, after we got broken, God fixed us. How? He sent the ultimate repairman his son, and his son repaired us. What word do we call it? Redemption. So Christ made us or fixed us, and we call that second great act of mercy redemption. Now, I have another question for you. I'm full of questions. Did Christ redeem all of mankind? Did Christ redeem every person who will ever live? Yes. Wonderful. Now, will all people who ever live be saved? No. no. We know this is church teaching. Some, unfortunately, be lost. So what's going on here? If Christ just stopped at redemption, the story would be incomplete. So the first great act of mercy was creation. God created us. We got broken. In the second great act of mercy, he sent his son, the second person of the Trinity, to fix us. He redeemed us. But now, now the key is to be saved. So in the third and final and the greatest act of mercy, guess who? The Holy Spirit wants to take us back to God the Father to be saved. We call that divinization or sanctification. And people say, Father, when does that happen? At our baptism? Yes, in many ways. We're divinized at our baptism. Well, when we die, Father, and we enter into heaven? Absolutely. Absolutely. But where does it happen every minute of every day somewhere around the world? The mass. That's what's happening when that priest, and I'm yelling again, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's where some, every minute of every day somewhere around the world is the mass. And in it, that's what the priest is doing. The priest is elevating that host and God the Holy Spirit is offering God the Son in unison, he's offering himself, of course, to God the Father. Guess what? Put yourself on that pattern. Unite to that offering of Jesus the Son to God the Father and unite yourself with it. Attach yourself to the cross, even if you have to hold on to the bottom of it. Jesus is going back to the Father. He wants to take you with him. Don't miss that boat. This is what's going on in the Mass. Now, the mass is very important, but I want to show you another picture that I think is very powerful, and it's related to the mass. Has anybody ever seen this picture? All right, as this powerful picture. Now, first of all, who's this? The devil, Satan, right? What's he doing? He's accusing, is he not? And who's this poor sap? Us. Us. Now... What is Satan accusing this guy of? Sin. You're half correct. Anybody know what I mean here? Satan is accusing this guy of unconfessed sin. Unconfessed sin. Exorcist tells us that in exorcism, Satan and the demons cannot bring up sins that have been confessed. You don't confess a sin, it's open season. 
They'll make fools out of you and they'll destroy you. Confess those sins. And tomorrow, or excuse me, Wednesday, we're going to talk about confession, what you need to know, and I promise you'll be things you've never heard. Come on Wednesday, because we're going to talk much more about confession. But for now, all I want to tell you is this demon or Satan right here, he's only accusing this guy of unconfessed sin. When you have confessed sin, he can't do that. Now, we have to make sure we confess. That's one thing. But you're not totally done yet. Because even though you've confessed your sin, you've still scarred the body of Christ. Remember I said, when you go to confession, the wound is healed, but the scar still remains. And we got to do something to repair that scar. Now, if you die and you still have un, uh, uh, atoned for sin, you and me are going to be in this position. Now, here's what I want to say. When this happens, I... I, I like to tell this story to my seventh grade catechism students. And I always say, I love seventh grade. You know why I love seventh grade? Because they're old enough to understand, but they're too young to be defiled yet by the world. I love seventh grade kids. They're just, they're great. So I tell the kids, guys, you're old enough to understand this. Hopefully none of you will be in this position. But I, I want you to think about this for a minute. What happens if you commit a terrible crime? And they all say, you get arrested. True. Then I say to them, what happens next? And they always, always say, you go to jail. They're forgetting something. What are they forgetting? You go before the judge. What's going on here? This is the throne of the judge. And you will be in front of him. And sorry, you will be alone. You'll have no spouse, no son, daughter, mother, father, brother, sister with you. You will be on your own. We all will be. We will all be in this position. Now, when you're in that position, the judge is going to pull out your rap sheet. Now, if you're like mine, they got a wheel in a truck. <laughs> See, I had a former life prior to becoming a priest. So, that's why when I said in the Mass, I said, when Jesus told St. Faustina that divine mercy is mankind's last hope of salvation, I said, you know, we got to listen. That's important. And Jesus said that if you don't pass through the doors of my mercy, you must pass through the doors of my justice. And what I said is, I don't know about you all, but I'm not making it through the doors of justice. I need the doors of mercy. You see, all God would have to do is look at one day in my college fraternity career and down I would go. But he's so loving and merciful, he gives us a chance. Where do we get the chance? Right here. Okay. Now, we will go before the judge. Now, the judge is going to look at your rap sheet. And when he looks at your rap sheet, he's going to say what? Hmm. Flip. Hmm. Flip. Hmm. Flip. Problem is, if you have any unatoned for sin, even though they've been confessed, Satan can't bring them up. But you still, in our church teaching, have to atone for our sins, do reparation, do penance, do satisfaction, all right? So maybe fasting or little sacrifices to make up for the sins that we've scarred the body of Christ. If you have any unatoned for sin, you will face this situation. Now, worse, some will probably go here with unconfessed sin, right? Now, now we're talking more serious. Now, if you have unconfessed sin, this can get a little more serious. The judge could be flipping through. And if you have unconfessed sin, that judge has every right to look at you and say, in fact, even if your sin is confessed, the fact is we are broken. We are sinners. And God has every right as the judge to say this, your sentence, well, based on your rap sheet, you've committed the worst possible crime. What is the worst possible crime? Sin. Why? Because it's a crime against God. Now, sin is the worst possible crime. And that judge could technically look at you and say, you've committed this horrible, these horrible crimes. Your sentence is death. Now, he can say that. He has every right to. He says, you deserve the death penalty. You deserve to die for your crimes eternally. Now... You're sitting there. You're distraught. 
You're in front of the judge. All of a sudden, in through the back of the courtroom walks a man. Long robe, sandals, or bare feet, long hair, beard. You've never met him, but you've seen pictures of him, and he comes up, and he stands next to you, and he gives you the most beautiful look of love. And he basically, and again, I'm just using this as an analogy. This is not church teaching. Please understand this. I'm just giving you a seventh grade analogy. Okay. Now, he basically says, Father, your honor, I will take their place. Now, what are you going to do? Are you going to say, oh, awesome, I'm out of here. <laughs> no. Our Protestant brothers and sisters, they got it right on the money here. You have to say, yes, I accept you. Jesus Christ is my personal Lord and Savior. Savior? Why? Because he just said, I'm willing to take your place. He is your Savior. So when you say, yes, I accept this gift, Jesus Christ, as you, as my personal Lord and Savior, because he says, I will take your place. You have to first say yes. You have to accept it. You just can't say, I'm out of here. You have to accept it. The Protestants nailed this right. We do have to say that. But here's the difference. The Protestants stop there. They think that that's it. That's all you have to do. Now, we Catholics believe different. And again, I'm just using an analogy here. I'm not saying that this is exactly what's going to happen. We don't know. What I am saying is, it's like this. Analogy is an illustration, a comparison. So what's going to happen, I believe in, the, in one sense, is you say, and who wouldn't, yes, I accept you, Jesus, as my personal Lord and Savior. You'd be surprised. Some may not. Because when you, you die in the state that you live, if you've been rejecting God your whole life, you may not be able to say yes. This is why we have to pray for those who died not in a state of grace. But then... The, the judge is going to say to you, do you accept us? You say, yes. Now you're free to go? Not quite so fast. Because the judge is going to say, okay, in order to work out the details, we all got to meet back on Sunday morning at 645 or 8 or 930 or 11 or 230 or 5 or 7. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? The mass right here at Sacred Heart. That's the time of the Mass. So before you can go, the judge is going to say, we got to work out the details. And the details are worked out at the Mass. Why? Okay, let's look at this. Can you see this? It's a little difficult, but this is one of the most beautiful pictures you will ever see. This is a station 12 at our shrine of divine mercy. This is Jesus on the cross. And this is the shrine all lit up. This is not Photoshop. That's an actual, actual picture. And we have this most beautiful life-size stations of the cross. And this picture here is just, to me, incredible. Now, I have another question for you. Why did Jesus die on the cross? For our sins, this is true. But he could have forgiven your sins from heaven. I heard somebody say, because he loves us. Is that true? Yes. But Jesus could have loved you from heaven. He did not need to die on a cross to say, I love you and let you into heaven. Okay, getting closer. Atonement. What do we mean by that? And all those things that you guys just said are true. He loves us, absolutely, but he could have loved us from heaven. To forgive our sins, true, but he could have forgives us for, from heaven. What you're forgetting is the big one. The penalty for sin, or Paul calls it the wage for sin, is death. When you sin or I sin, we deserve to die. Back to there. The judge is basically saying, you deserve the death penalty. You've committed the worst possible crime. You're a sinner. Guess what? Somebody's got to die. Now you have a choice. It can either be you or you can accept this gift of him. Which one do you want? Well, Father, that's a no-brainer. We're all going to say, Jesus, really? Truly? But well, wait a minute, didn't that judge just say in order to work out the details, I need you to come back at 645 or 8 or 930 or 11 or 12, what is it, 230 and 5 and 7? 
Why? Why? Because as a baptized Catholic, at the Mass, you are present at Calvary as Jesus is paying your debt for sin. As a baptized Catholic at the Mass, you are not re-crucifying Christ. You know, this is a very mis big misconception of us Catholics. I'll tell another quick story. I was for a while, um, when I was in North Carolina, it was my very first night in North Carolina. And I'm trying to go get some supplies in Walmart. And I'm walking through Walmart and I have my Benedict cross on. Anybody know what a Benedict cross is? It's got the corpus of Jesus' body on the cross and I'm wearing it around my neck. And this woman, God bless her, she sees me in North Carolina and she says, you must be Catholic. <laughs> and I says, yes. And she says, why do you keep re-crucifying Christ? He is not on that cross anymore. Why do you crazy Catholics keep him on that cross? My Jesus is risen. This is a great point. And God bless her. I am not criticizing her. In fact, I don't see too many Catholics doing that. Do you see many Catholics going up to somebody worrying about their salvation? She was worried about my salvation. God bless her. I have no problem with that. In fact, I commend her. But we got into a nice discussion. So she says to me, why do you crazy Catholics keep crucifying Christ on the cross? She says, Jesus ain't on the cross anymore. Sir, Jesus ain't on that cross no more. I says, ma'am, God bless you, but do you suffer in any way? She says, yeah. I says, then Jesus in some ways is still on that cross. He's with us. What's the definition of mercy? When love encounters suffering, it takes action to do something. It's, in, it's taking the pains of the one and making them your pain. Christ is on the cross with us when we suffer. Now, she said, but he ain't on that cross anymore. I says, ma'am, again, if, if you're suffering, he is on that cross in some sense. And she said this, she said, no, he ain't. And I said, well, ma'am, can I ask you a question? Now, it was Christmas time. I moved down there during Christmas. And I said, do you have a nativity scene? And she says, yeah, actually, I got two. <laughs> she says, yeah, so like a guardian angel, right? She says, I got two. She says, I have one at home, and I even have one at work. And they don't even challenge me because they know my love for my Lord. And I have the, 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 the little nativity scene right there in my office at work. And I said, God bless you. That's awesome. So you got the little nativity scene? She goes, yeah. I said, you got the animals and the, and the, and the, and the oxen and the, and the sheep and the donkeys? She's like, yeah. And I said, and, and you got the shepherds coming around and, or the wise men and they're offering the gifts to Jesus? She goes, yeah. And I said, you got the Mary and the Joseph there? And she's like, yeah, it's beautiful. And I said, and you got the little baby Jesus in the crib? And she says, yeah. And I said, ma'am, Jesus ain't in that crib no more. <laughs> <laughs> and she was, she was like, ah, she, she never thought of that. The point, the point is, yes, we do not re-crucify Christ anymore, but Christ, when we are at the mass, you are at Calvary as Christ is paying that debt for your sin. Now, as Catholics, this is what we are called to do. This is the way to our salvation. Do you remember the scripture passage where the king takes his servant and he says, I want you to go out and round up all the people to come to celebrate the wedding feast. You remember this passage? And what happens? The servant goes out and he says, come to the wedding. And what does the first guy say? He says, well, you know what? I just, I just bought a plot of land. I got to go inspect it. I'm too busy. You consider me excused. And then the next one he goes to. And what does he say? Come to the wedding feast. And what does that guy say? Sorry, I just started a business. I can't. I'm too busy. Consider me excused. Then he goes to the third guy. What does he say? Hey, I just got married. Now that might be a valid excuse. <laughs> but he says, consider me excused. What happens? The servant goes back to the king and he tells him. The king says what? Does he say, oh, don't worry. That's okay. Don't worry about it. Maybe next time. Is that what the king says? No. What does the king say? He was enraged. 
He says, I'm offering you the most beautiful gift in the world and you don't have any time to come away with you. Throw them out where there's nailing, wailing and grinding of teeth. Now, did the king punish those who weren't invited? Uh Uh-uh. The king didn't punish those who weren't invited. That's the pygmy in the rainforest. He wasn't invited, but God has his ways. God will give him that opportunity. I'm not saying he's totally left out in the cold. Not at all. God will give him an opportunity. Absolutely to be saved. But you have been given a ticket to the show. You have been given a ticket to the, to the most beautiful wedding in the world. You've been invited. You have been invited. And so when you come, that's what the mass is. And at that wedding feast of the lamb, you come up and you meet your groom here at the altar and it is consummated. You then go to the mass, just like the judge said, go to the mass because at the mass, your savior is paying your debt to sin. What's the debt? Death. What's going on at the mass? Pope Benedict says in the mass, in his book, the spirit of the liturgy, Pope Benedict says, it's like the roof opens up and heaven and earth ascend and descend and they are united. And when you go to Mass, guess what? You, as I said, are at Calvary. You are present as Christ is actually being put on the cross to pay your penalty. And where is it happening? Here on the altar. This is the sacrifice of the Son to the Father eternally. It happens throughout all eternity. There's no time for God. God's outside of time. There's no past for God. There's no future for God. It's all happening at one moment. Christ is on this cross at one moment. Even though it was 2,000 years ago, you're there. And this is your salvation. This is your ticket. And yet we don't have time for it. No, this is the answer. At every mass, we see Christ on the cross because this is what's going on. Now, I've got five minutes to finish, and I want to finish here. All right. What we have in our gift of our faith is something extraordinary. I want to start with this. God's mercy I've been describing in the Mass, but what about all those poor people that lived before the Mass? The Mass was not instituted until Jesus lived, correct? What about all the other people before him? Did they get mercy? Let's go all the way back to Adam and Eve. Did they get mercy? All right. Uh Uh-huh. Let's look at this. First of all, do we as Catholics have to believe that Adam and Eve were actually real people? Do we? Yes. Yes, you do. And I want to know, you know, the national media couldn't get fast enough to the parking lot of the Boston Chancery's office when the scandal broke in 2002. I want to know where those same media people were when a few years earlier, scientists proved genetically out of the UK and I think here in Cal State or somewhere, that do you know every living person in the world today, alive today, can be traced back to one woman? Did you know that? Every living person in the world today can be traced back to one woman. But you don't hear that. Now, the other thing people say, well, Father, we don't, you know, the way we buy, the, read the Bible, these are just stories. Okay, I got a question for you. Do you read or do we as Catholics read the Bible as literally true? I heard some no's. I heard, I'm really getting you tonight. I heard some no's. I heard some yeses. Do we read the Bible as literally true? Yes. yes. Now go home tonight and cut off your right hand. <laughs> what do I mean? The literally true meaning is true. In other words, when, when Jesus said, if there's something in your life causing you to sin, get rid of it, this is literally true. We use the word literally in English differently than it's really meant to be meaned in the original language or meant. Here's the thing. Literally true means that the message the author is trying to convey is true. Yes, we read the Bible as literally true. The message is if there's something in your life causing you to sin, you got to get rid of it. Boyfriend, girlfriend, computer, whatever it is, you got to get rid of whatever's causing you to sin. Now, we don't read the Bible, however, as literalists that we actually take a saw and cut off our right hand. So we read the Bible as literally true. If there's something in your life, get rid of it, but not as literalists, meaning we actually get a saw out. Jesus did use hyperbole. So back to this. 
I've been describing mercy in the mass, but does mercy go before the mass? Yes, it went all the way back to Adam and Eve. God's mercy is most seen in the mass, but it goes back to the beginning of time. Now, as I said, with my last few minutes, what was the problem with Adam and Eve? What did Adam and Eve do that got us in a pickle? They sinned. Yes, this is true. But was that the real problem? Yeah, it was the basis. But the real mess is what happened after. What happened after? First of all, did Adam and Eve ask for God's mercy and forgiveness? No, they didn't. Did Adam and Eve be merciful to each other? No. Now, Adam, there's a real man. Remember when the Lord said, what have you done? And Adam says, whoa, Lord, it's the woman you gave me. It's her fault. I mean, we've been blaming each other from the beginning of time. You know, the seventh grader came up. I love my seventh graders. He came up to me and he says, Father, did you just hear that they, they just dis discovered some new documents and, and written in the Dead Sea Scrolls that detailed more about Adam and Eve? I'm like, really? I was like, no. And he said, yeah, Father, they got this all documented now. And he says, it's gonna, it, the news is going to come out. You're going to hear about this shortly. I said, whoa, so what did it say? He said, well, basically, they got written documentation of the story of Adam and Eve in much more details has been passed down. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, you know, in fact, Adam, after they were kicked out of the garden, Adam was walking in front of the garden with Cain and Abel. And he said, Father, this is, this is now known. And I said, wow. He said, Adam was walking with Cain and Abel outside the garden. They had already been kicked out. And, and Cain and Abel went by it, and Abel looked in, and he said, man, Dad, this is incredible. I, look, it's paradise. I mean, there's no suffering. There's no work. There's no toil. There's no sweat of the brow. And here we are hoeing and raking and, and doing all this. And I'm sitting there listening to this kid. I'm like, okay, keep going. And he says, yeah, Father. And he said that Cain, or excuse me, Abel looks into the thing. And he says, Dad, did we really used to live there? And he said, yes, yeah, son, we did. He said, Dad, look at it. It's beautiful. He said, now we don't get to go in. He said, no, son. He said, Dad, what happened? And he said, your mother ate us out of house and home. <laughs> <laughs> I was shook, uh, what do you call it, snookered by a seventh grader. So, so anyway, the big problem for Adam and Eve, yeah, they sinned, but what happened afterwards? They didn't ask for God's mercy. Did they be merciful to each other? No, they blamed each other. And did they completely trust God? Did they trust God? No. And please come back Wednesday. We're going to talk a lot more about trust. But what did they do instead? They ran and they hid. Now, the problem with Adam and Eve, yes, they sinned. But a real problem was the fact that Adam and Eve didn't know their A, B, Cs. The message of divine mercy is not optional. People hear divine mercy, they think of the devotion, which is what we're going to talk about on Wednesday. They think of the chaplet and the novena and the feast and all that. What they don't realize is that the message of divine mercy is actually, according to Pope Benedict, the nucleus of the gospel. Pope Benedict said that the message of divine mercy, because remember, divine mercy is both a message and a devotion. Devotions are technically optional in the Catholic Church. The message of divine mercy is not. It is the heart of the gospel. The message of divine mercy is the core nucleus of the gospel. Basically, you reject the message of divine mercy, you reject the gospel. What is it? All right. A, Scripture tells us, if you do not repent and ask for forgiveness, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You must, A, ask for God's mercy and forgiveness. B, be merciful to each other. Now, Catholics, take out your Bibles. What does Matthew 25 tell us? Oh, you're Catholics. You don't have your Bibles. <laughs> what does Matthew 25 tell us? It's the parable of the sheep and the goats, right? Okay, now... It says at the end, the king will divide the sheep from the goats. On the right, he will place the sheep. And he will say, well done. When I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. Well done. And they say, Lord, Lord, 
When did we see you hungry, thirsty, naked, and in prison? And did we do those things for you? And he said, what you did for the least of my brethren, you did it for me. He said, welcome into the joy of your father's kingdom. Sorry, goats. To you, he will say, when I was hungry, you did not give me food. When I was naked, you did not clothe me. Thirsty, you did not give me drink. In prison, you did not visit me. And they say, Lord, Lord, when did we see you naked, thirsty, in prison, or without clothing, or uh, thirsty, or hungry? And he says, what you did not do for the least of my brethren, you did not do it for me. Now, does he say, try next time? No. He says, away with you into the eternal fire. Eternal. In other words, we have to be merciful to each other to get to heaven. There's not an option here. And Jesus told St. Faustina in paragraph 742 of the diary, he gives you three ways to be merciful. If you can't do something nice for somebody, because you can't even be in the same room with Aunt Emma, <laughs> you can say something nice about Aunt Emma. No, Father, I can't even utter the words <laughs> to say something nice about Aunt Emma. Okay? You can pray for Aunt Emma. Word, deed, or prayer. Christ says we must be merciful to each other or we do not enter the kingdom of God. Finally, completely trust in God's mercy. This is the most important of all. What does that mean to trust in God? Again, Wednesday, please come. We're going to explain it because I know I'm out of time here. But in this one message, we have everything. Jesus told St. Faustina, trust is the vessel by which all grace is received. Y'all want to get to heaven? You need grace. How do you get grace? Jesus said, trust is the vessel by which all grace is received. You want to get to heaven, you need grace. You want grace, you got to trust. And again, we will explain that coming up in the next couple talks. How do we trust God? All right. These three things, you have all three of these, you will get to heaven guaranteed. This is scripture. This is the message of divine mercy. This is the nucleus of the gospel. This is all you need. You miss any one of these, you cannot get to heaven. You have all three of these, you will get to heaven. And again, trust is the most important. We'll explain that more on Wednesday. So my last slide of the evening, the whole Bible in one slide, the entire Bible in one slide. Aha, what is it? All right, the Bible is a love story. It starts with a wedding, Adam and Eve, and it ends with a wedding. What's the last book of the Bible? Revelation. Revelation. Is Revelation about the Antichrist and the rapture? Nope. Doesn't even mention the word Antichrist and the rapture was created by some young lady in Scotland in the 1800s. It's not in the Bible. What is the book of Revelation about? The Mass. And what did I just teach you tonight is the Mass? The wedding feast. The Bible is a love story that begins with a wedding and ends with a wedding. And in between, God, the creator, the loving father, is trying to get you to trust him, to trust him and to come back to him. What is trust? People think all you need is faith to get to heaven. No. Abraham had faith in God, but he didn't, if he didn't trust him, he wouldn't have been willing to sacrifice Isaac, right? I could have faith in God, but if he asked me to sacrifice my son, I could have said no because I didn't have trust in him. When Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac, it was not a matter of obedience only. It was a matter of trust. How? Because God said through this little boy, I will make your descendants as great as the stars of the sky or the sands of the seashore. Now you're asking me to kill him? How in the world, Lord, are you going to make my nation and my progeny as wide as the stars or the sands on the shore if you're telling me to kill this boy through which it's going to come? I don't know, but I trust you. And he was willing to do it. It's not obedience necessarily. It was trust. Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it, but you're going to do it if you even have to raise this little kid from the dead. This is what it is. So, The Bible is a love story to get us to come back, to trust him. 
We're skittish creatures now. We're afraid. We're scared. That's why God gave us Mary. Because God is this transcendent being to most people. But Mary helps bridge the gap. She's one of us. So, first part, a love story. Second, the great commandments. What did Jesus say the great commandments are? Love God and love your neighbor. Do you know those two can be rolled up? The saints tell us into one. Do the will of God. You do these three things, you're doing the will of God. You ask for God's mercy, that's his will. You're merciful to each other, that's his will. You completely trust him, that's his will. You want to know the great commandments? To love God, that's his will. Love your neighbor, that's his will. Do the will of God. Simply that difficult, but that easy. You do the will of God. And finally, you live the ABCs and you get to heaven. If you remember nothing else, remember that book, Everything I Ever Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten? <laughs> Everything you need to know is your ABCs. Ask for God's mercy, be merciful to each other, and completely trust. This is the message of divine mercy. This message of divine mercy, A, B, C, is your ticket. Compassed with what the whole Bible is in one slide, a love story of our loving Father trying to bring us back obeying the commandments of loving him and loving our neighbor and living the ABCs. You haven't read the Bible cover to cover? Here it is. This is it. Pope Benedict said to us, as I said, the message of mercy is the nucleus of the gospel. This is the message of mercy. If you have it, you are on your way. If you don't have it, it's not too late. This is the answer, and it starts and ends with God's mercy. And that finally is the end of this presentation of God's mercy. Thank you very much, everybody. The image of Jesus, the divine mercy incarnate, represents the Lord as coming forth from the Holy of Holies in heaven to ensure us of the forgiveness of our sins after having entered there to bring the offering of his life to the Father as the ransom. The dark background symbolizes the total darkness in the Holy of Holies of the earthly tabernacle, which was illumined only by God's presence as he received the atoning sacrifice. That scene of Christ's coming out of the Holy of Holies with rays emanating from his wounded side represent the blood and water, that is, the Holy Spirit, as the source of life handed over, according to St. John's Gospel, at the moment of his death. As one of the prayers of St. Faustina points out, You died, Jesus, but the source of life gushed out for the souls, and a sea of mercy opened up for the whole world.